What is up everybody? This is Mike with Tiny Life Big Mission and this week in the Word we are studying the holiday of Halloween to see if Christians should be celebrating it or not. Grab your word of truth and let's jump in. Welcome to This Week in the World, where this segment of the channel focuses on a weekly Bible study where we share truth based on what the Word of God says. If you have questions about God or you are seeking truth, I welcome you. I want to thank you all for joining us here today, and I hope that this video is a good resource for your personal study. This week's study, we'll be looking at the holiday of Halloween to see if Christians should be celebrating it or if we can redeem it for good. Now, just as a reminder, this video, along with others like it, have been grouped into a playlist called Christian Holidays, which can be found under the Playlist tab on our channel's main page. If you are new to this channel or are interested in understanding more about our position, please check out our quick reference video on our five guiding principles. I will link that video on the top of the screen here. Now, the date that I'm recording this video is October 27, 2023, right before Halloween. Now, I had no intentions to ever cover this topic, but it seems to have come up a number of times here recently, and considering the state of the church and all that we covered last week, I figured I'd better cover this topic, uh, the topic of Halloween, now. So, for some believers, the answer to participating in Halloween might seem very obvious, but there are people out there who either have been taught bad doctrine don't know better or are completely ignorant as newborn believers. Not everyone has everything revealed at the same time or at the moment of salvation. It's a, it's a process. It's a journey where we uh, are enlightened as we go. Now, there was a time in my life that I professed a belief in Christ, yet I engaged in the common traditions of Halloween. I didn't see anything wrong with it. And the church that I was attending did this trunk or treat community outreach thing, so I didn't see any harm in enjoying the fun of the season. Now, each Christian is going to have to make up their own mind for themselves because they're each going to have to give an account for themselves on how they choose everything in their life, and this is no different than any of those other choices. The choice that I have made is to stay away from Halloween, and the thing that changed my mind, what, what was the primary reason for changing my mind, was driven from what the Bible says. As a follower of Jesus Christ, the goal is to grow to be more like Christ. How we know Christ is through the Bible. So as a believer, I should be basing my decisions in my life on what the Bible says. Right? That's a pretty basic view of Christianity in a nutshell. The problem with that is that the Bible doesn't provide us with specific guidance like, should I buy that new car, or should I take the promotion at work, or other questions that we may struggle with. What the Bible does answer is how we are to approach decisions in our life. The Bible tells us things to do and things not to do. And it's through these basic instructions that we can find answers to the more specific questions. So when we look at the question, is it wrong for Christians to participate in Halloween, we do not find a verse that says, thou shall not trick or treat, or something silly like that. The Bible is not that specific. However, we do find guidance for this in the Bible based on knowing who we are as believers and what we've been called to as believers. You are the only person who can make the decision as to whether or not you will participate in Halloween. My goal is to show you what the Bible says so that with that information, you can make an informed decision that you believe will lead you away from sin and to glorifying God. So there are a couple of key concepts about believers from the Bible that I want you to consider. We are going to look at some verses here. I don't want you to just take my word on any of this. I want you to see it from the Bible so that it is the Bible that is your authority on this, not what I say. So grab your Bible and anything that you may want to take notes with and follow along as we go. The first point that I want you to consider is that as Christians, meaning believers in Christ, we have been purchased by the precious blood of Christ. This is spoken of quite a bit in the Bible, but we're just going to look at a few verses and we'll see that what it says, it says very clearly. Let's go on ahead and start by opening up your Bible to 1 Corinthians 6 and we'll look at verse 19 and 20. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says, 
What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. As Christians, the Bible teaches us that we are not our own. Our bodies do not belong to us, therefore we should not be making decisions based on what our body wants us to do, to glorify our own body. We should be glorifying God in our body and in our spirit because they don't belong to us. They're God's, and therefore we should use them for His glory. If you keep continuing in 1 Corinthians to the next chapter, chapter 7, verse 23, this concept is echoed again where it says, Ye are bought with the price, be not ye the servants of men. Meaning that we shouldn't focus on doing what pleases men, we should focus on doing what pleases God. In Ephesians, it talks about redemption. Now, the word redemption means to buy back that which was lost. So again, this is echoing that Christians, people who belong to Christ, have been redeemed through his blood, for him. They are part of his purchased possession. Ephesians 1 verse 7 says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, speaking about Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. That shows that his redemption is through his blood. Verse 14 says, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. This is talking about the Holy Spirit that we're sealed with as an earnest payment for his purchased possession. What he gives us in earnest with the exchange that we make with him is he gives us his Holy Spirit, seals us with that Holy Spirit until the time where our bodies are actually redeemed and we get a new body with Christ. Ephesians 4.30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Again, that future event when we get our new bodies, but it's part of him buying us back as part of that redemption. Now, part of our purchasing, part of the reason why God has purchased us with his blood is that so we are a peculiar people to this world. We're separated from them. We don't do the same things that they do. We're, we're set apart in glory and praise to him. We see that in a number of scriptures, but the first one that we're going to look at is in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And in verse 14 through 17, it says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Belial is just the devil. Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. Notice it calls him the living God there. We'll come back to that later. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. This is pretty clear and simple instruction that as believers in this world, we are not to be of the world, even though we're in the world. We're supposed to be separate from the world, living our lives for God as, his, as this body has been purchased as his temple. Next, we'll look at Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, where it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. We're going to pause right there in verse 1. Presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice. That means you are giving your body over by a means of sacrifice. You are letting it go to God to be a holy, acceptable sacrifice unto him. And the Bible says that this is a reasonable service for us. Verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's very clear in these scriptures that we are not to emulate or join forces with or be part of the world. We're supposed to be separate. Let me give you one last reference here. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, speaking about the body of Christ, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So it's not just that we are supposed to be separated in terms of like a distance, but we're supposed to be separated in terms of how we look, how we act, the standards that we hold ourselves to. And the last thing that the Bible tells us about us as believers is that we are crucified. Our bodies are considered dead and are no longer our main focus, our priority. We now, being buried with Christ, 
have risen with Christ and live unto Christ. I'll show you this in a couple verses here real quick. We'll start out in Romans chapter 6, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Galatians 2.20 says, And I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 6.14 But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Paul says multiple times in his writings and his epistles that he is our example and we are to follow him as he followed Christ. And what he says about himself is that he has crucified himself to this world and he lives after Christ. And that's our example that we're supposed to follow. We are supposed to render ourselves dead to the world and a dead man can't interact with the world. So we're dead to the world to where we can live for Christ. Second Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Once you are in Christ, that old self of yours is rendered dead, and there's a new creature that you become a part of known as the body of Christ. And as part of that body, you don't live in the flesh that you used to live in, the old man. You live for the new man. And again, this is expressed all over the place. We're not checking all the references, but just to give you a few here, Colossians 3, 9 and 10 says, Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. So there's a lot that we can look at from the Bible and learn whether we should be engaging in something or not, just based on what we're supposed to be doing, not what does it say specifically about that event. You could take this same application of the fact that we have been purchased and we are separated and we've been crucified and apply it to a lot of different decisions that you might need to make, not just particularly about this holiday. So it's good to consider these things before you even jump off into the the aspect of is this decision good or not, knowing what the Bible says and expects of us in terms of our day-to-day normal behavior. So what is Halloween all about? If you had never experienced anything about this holiday and your first exposure to it was today, what would you conclude it is celebrating? It's an honest question I want you to consider and ask yourself. What do all the commercials on TV suggest about it? What is the common theme behind the marketing that you see online, that you see on your television, in any other form of advertising? What is the advertising say about it. And I'm not even talking about the history or the origin of the customs that are used to celebrate. Uh, I could dive into all that history, but I think most people can do enough research for themselves to see that the background is is very dark and riddled with demonic stuff. And that's a totally separate video in and of itself. My point is that it shouldn't take a long time to discover that this holiday focuses on the darker side of things. It focuses on death and horror and fear and gore. The most prominent and classic costume for this holiday is a witch. And I could go on and on, but I think that you get what I'm driving at. The question I want you to consider is, are the core components, traits, and characteristics or ideologies of this celebration honoring to God? Ask yourself that on a real honest open plane. The Bible talks about some of these things specifically. We're not going to spend a ton of time here, but I want to show you that the Bible is very clear being against some of the most recognizable elements of this holiday. First, we'll start with vampires. This again is a very common costume, one of the most popular costumes out there. You see it in movies and in the folklore all surrounding the traditions of Halloween. What are vampires known for? Drinking blood, right? What does the Bible say about drinking blood? Let's turn to Leviticus 7.26, where the Bible says, Moreover, you shall eat no manner of blood, whether it be of fowl or of beast, in any of your dwellings. Whatsoever soul it be that eateth any manner of blood, even that soul shall be cut off from his people. 
Now, this is not the only place that the Bible talks about not eating blood. It's all throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. God is very specific that he does not, he abhors eating of blood. Another very common character or part, trait, element of Halloween is ghosts and ghouls. And in the light that it, that the holiday celebrates them, it, they're, it, it's like talking with ghosts and uh, spookiness of ghosts and ghost stories and things like that. But do ghosts and what the the way that the the holiday, the cultural folklore premise speaks about them, is that honoring to God? Is that something that that pleases God or not? The Bible actually talks about this. We see it in Leviticus twenty verse six, where it says, "And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits." That means those who communicate with ghosts. Familiar spirits are ghosts, and after wizards to go a whoring after them. That's the language the Bible uses. Is when you go seeking after ghosts, you are whoring around on God. And God says, I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. It is not good to consult with familiar spirits. It's not good to entertain ghosts at all. You see nothing about it good from the Bible. In Halloween, you see this common theme of death. There's graveyards and beings coming back from the dead. And it doesn't matter if it's an animal or a human or whatever. There's a, there's a lot of death culture. Is death honoring to God? I don't think so. In fact, the Bible says clearly that he's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. Uh, we see one such verse in Matthew 22, verse 32. And this verse is Jesus kind of scolding the religious leaders of that day because if they didn't see him as the living God and they didn't believe in the resurrection or his power to resurrect from the dead. And Jesus is telling them, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. In fact, God is called the living God 30 times in the Bible. He is a God of life. He creates. He builds up. He doesn't approve of death. He doesn't approve of decay. That's all from sin, and it's against everything that brings him honor and glory. In fact, under the law, the priests were not even allowed to touch dead things. Death is considered unclean. Death is corrupt. It's not good, and it's not a good representation for God. It doesn't bring God honor in any way, shape, or form. The last and most classic uh, theme that you see inside of uh, this holiday, Halloween, is witches and wizards. And do witches and wizards bring glory to God? Do they honor God? You see this a lot in culture today. In fact, uh, there's a big movement in the New Age that teach that there are such things as good witches. And the Bible says that thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. That doesn't mean that only the bad witches you don't suffer to live, <laughs> good or bad. It's a whole different topic for a different day. But what does the Bible say about witches and wizards? You might be surprised, but it actually talks a lot about them. Let's look at Deuteronomy 18, verse 10 through 13. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. That pretty much sums up the whole mob squad of Halloween right there in one foul swoop. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. Makes it pretty clear that he's against these things. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doeth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. And the world does like to try to muddy the waters. They like to try to make it out that there can be good wizards or it's okay to communicate with the dead as long as you're doing it for good. And there's no such thing as doing it for good. These things are an abomination. It doesn't matter how you intend it to go. It does not please God, period. And that leads us to the question of, are these things able to be redeemed? As Christians, can't we make them clean in the name of Jesus? Can't we do them for God's glory or do something similar to it for God's glory? Now again, as believers, we should be finding our instructions from the Bible. How we answer questions is based on the 
the precepts that we find in the Bible. So we may not find an exact answer of uh, exactly how to do something, but we can look at the examples that we find in the Bible and relate them to it to make a connection for how we should respond, how we should act, that kind of thing. So what do we see when it comes to redeeming things for good? I've heard this talked a lot about in the church and a number of, I would say, more... Uh, spiritual type denominations, you see this conversation a lot about redeeming evil for good. And let's just look to the Bible and see what the Bible has to say about it. So how do we redeem evil? Where are the instructions at? Well, I hate to break it to you, but humans cannot redeem evil. There are no instructions, no commandments, no statutes, or verses for that matter, that tell believers to redeem evil. There's only one who can redeem evil, and that is God. He, his plan to redeem evil existed before the world ever began, and it's only through his strength that any redemption from evil ever happens. God is able to make this redemption through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. That's his power. There is no example for us to be able to redeem stuff the way that we choose to redeem stuff. Things that are evil are evil, and there's no instruction to redeem it. What we do see instruction for, however, is to flee from evil, that we are supposed to avoid it. And part of the separation that we see as Christians is separating from that evil because we are weak. We are prone to give in to it. The Bible is very clear that we're supposed to draw a big fat line between us and evil. Again, I'm just hitting the tippy top of the iceberg. The, there's so much content in the Bible uh, against evil and about us staying separate from it. It would take me forever to go through all of it. But to give you a couple quick references, uh, we'll start first in Isaiah 5, chapter 20. This is God speaking through the prophet Isaiah. And he says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. God doesn't like those things being muddied up. He wants them to be very clearly, distinctly separate. Good over here, evil over there. You don't call them the same. You don't mix them together. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 Abstain from all appearance of evil. This is an instruction to the body of Christ, to Christian believers. We are not supposed to just not do evil. We're supposed to abstain from all appearance of evil. Ephesians 5.11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Again, an instruction to the believers in the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 10.21, ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. John's third epistle, verse 11, beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Romans 12, 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. And just in case there's any of you who might still be thinking to yourself, you know, I don't understand what the big deal is with a couple of kids dressing up in some costumes and going out in the neighborhood and collecting some candy. Not a big deal. Let me just share something with you. You may not know who this man is, but his name is Anton LaVey. He is the founder of the First Church of Satan. He is the author of the Satanic Bible and has been involved with many Satanic rituals as well as producing Satanic music, writing Satanic literature. He's authored tons of books. He's produced several records. He's an evil man. He worships Satan openly. And this is a legit quote from him. He says that he is glad that Christian parents let their children worship the devil at least one night out of the year. And if you know anything about footholds, that's all Satan needs. He just needs one night out of the year. If you're willing to let go of it for one night, that little piece of acceptance or tolerance is enough for him to get a, a grip. And why this is so critically important is because what it says in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. When you train your child that it's okay to let go of Christian values and things that honor God for one night out of the year, 
You're training them in the way that they should go. It's no different than telling your kids not to lie, but then asking them to lie for something. Teaching them that, that lies are bad, but then lying to them about a fictional character who comes down the chimney or something like that. You are setting your children up for failure. You're, you're giving them a false example to follow. And when they're old, they're not going to depart from it. That's part of the reason why the church is so apostate right now. And it's part of the reason why you see these people who are, are teachers and self-professed preachers, whether they've been educated in theology or not, is irrelevant. Whether they've been called of God is the more accurate question that we should be asking. Based on their teaching, which isn't from the Bible... It's based out of their own logic in thinking that men can redeem something that is evil in their own power is nuts. There is no example in the Bible that shows us where we are supposed to engage in something that is considered wicked or evil in order to make it better. <laughs> There's just not an example for it. I think that that's where the line starts to fade a little bit. You, you start making these exceptions and saying, okay, well... The world does this, so let's, as the body of Christ, do something really similar to it. Instead of calling it trick or treat, we'll call it trunk or treat. And instead of going around the neighborhood, we'll, we'll have them come to our building and do it there. It, it's the exact same thing. You're, you're still celebrating. You're still engaging in the behavior. And you have to ask yourself, because of in the end, we're going to have to give an account for every idle word that comes out of our mouth, every thought that we don't bring into submission, everything that we do, we're going to have to give an account for. And so I want you to be able to make a educated decision before you get to the celebration as to whether or not the things that you will be doing are going to be honoring to God or not. That should be the lens that we are answering this question through. Personally, and am totally against this holiday. I think that there's enough out there that shows that it's demonic, that it shouldn't even be a topic that I need to cover because we all as believers should know that this is just a no-no. It's a worldly thing that we stay away from. Again, like I said earlier in the video, I've had a number of questions come up about it, and um, I think a lot of them are innocent, but worth addressing. And you're going to have to come to your own conclusion, but my conclusion is no. Now that's going to conclude this week's study, but before you go, if you're wanting to know how to support the work that we do here, there are five easy ways. First is you can share our studies with those who you know who need the Word of God. You can also share them on all your social media platforms. Second is to like this video if you found the content helpful. Third is to subscribe to our channel if you haven't done so already. These three actions support the algorithms in YouTube to help the Word to go out. Fourth is through giving. This work that I do in the mission field is my full-time job. So if you want to buy Kate and I a dinner or a cup of coffee or anything, there's no gift that is too small. If you feel led to give, you can send your gift of support through Venmo or Zelle. For Venmo, use the QR code on the screen or search by email, which is how you will find me on Zelle as well. But most importantly, the biggest way that you can support this ministry is through prayer. James 5.16 says that the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. People need truth and your prayers can help, so please pray for this mission. If you have questions or would like to share your story, the best way to communicate with me is by email, which is tinylifebigmission at gmail.com. I simply ask that you remember our five guiding principles before reaching out. And that's all the time that we have for this week. I hope to see you next week in this word. Okay, bye. Okay, bye.